I'm Cynthia James, and this network is about changing lives one woman at a time. Welcome to Women Awakening. I am your host, Cynthia James, and I'm very excited to be with you. I get the opportunity to introduce you to women that are inspiring, that inspire me, that are change makers in the world, that are absolute models for what it looks like when you step into the fullness and the greatness of who you come here to be. So I'm thrilled that I get to do this. I do a podcast every week and we're on, you can find us on iHeart and iTunes and you can find us on Amazon and YouTube, anywhere you can get a podcast. So please subscribe and come back every week and meet these amazing women. So my guest today, Christine Nyanya, and I think I may have screwed up her name, but she's going to say it because uh, we, we, we practiced. Uh, she is the managing director of Strategia Advisors, a boutique advertising adver, advisory firm serving East African clients. And she's accumulated over 20 years of experience in corporate and project finance, strategy, and economic development advisory work. She is also the founder of KendiArt.com, the first online marketplace for contemporary East African art and an angel investor in the fintech and renewable energy sectors. She has worked in deals uh, advisory at PricewaterhouseCoopers, Kenya, where she managed M&A capital uh, raising, public-private partnerships, valuation, and due diligence assignments. She served as assistant vice president at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. She is an Eisenhower Fellow, and she currently chairs the board of Sanlam General Insurance Kenya Limited and has served on the boards of Revolution Analytics, Strauss Energy, and Carolina for Kiberia. Well, Christine, welcome. I am so happy you're here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Well, and you are my first African guest. And so I'm thrilled that you're here. And I really want to talk about you. I want to talk about the work that you're doing. But could you tell us a little bit about where you come from, where you were born, what your family life was like? Sure. Uh, so I get I'll repeat my last name, Nganga. That's how it sounds. Uh, and I guess for your guests, uh, for your uh, guests to, to know. But in terms of background, I was born in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, I was born in 1975 in the city of Nairobi. I'm the, four, I'm the fourth and last child of David and Grace Nganga. <laughs> uh, and all my siblings are women. So we are four women. And uh, yes, I grew up in a fairly ordinary, I would say, middle class family. Um, my, both of my parents were in teaching. And, uh, and at some point, my dad stopped working because he fell ill. So it was long term. My, unfortunately, my dad ended up having uh, paranoid schizophrenia. So that made uh, life a little, change a little. And my mom decided to pivot out of uh, education also down the road and went back to school and went into the hotelier business and ended up being a businesswoman running uh, various restaurants and cafeterias around uh, Nairobi. And that, I think, is where I got my bug to sort of get into business and, and want to engage in that space. Um, so I, I grew up in Kenya, went to primary school, what we call secondary school, high school here. And at the end of uh, my high school at age uh, 17, 18, I ended up uh, getting a scholarship to go and study my undergraduate in Canada in a small town called Peterborough, just outside northeast of Toronto. And uh, that's why I did my undergraduate degree in uh, economics and political science. Yeah. Uh, and then I worked there for a number of years. Uh, my plan initially was to come right back to Kenya uh, right after school, but I ended up staying a little longer because just around that time, it was the 
early to mid uh, two th- uh, not two thousand sorry nineties uh, um, there was uh, the economy the African continent the economy was a bit of a mess we were in the middle of what were called structural adjustment policies that really devastated a lot of economies on the continent and so I remember everyone telling me if go back to school stay in school for a while if you come here you won't find work at this time and that's what led me to stay in Kenya in 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 Canada for a little while and then after that I actually after a few years in 2004 I moved to the U.S. to do my graduate school uh, where I pursued a a degree in uh, a master's in public administration uh, with a focus in policy and finance. And I did that in New York, which is where I stayed until 20, 2010 and then we decided to move back to Kenya. Wow. Well, quite a journey for you. And um, and and I want to say, first of all, um, bless your, your dad having five women in the house with a lot of energy. Right. <laughs> you know, and right. then... And, and 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 I want to tell you there there is someone very dear in my in my family who has uh, uh, schizophrenia and it is it is quite a, a challenging thing and so so I guess I want to know I, I want to know from you personally how did you manage the energy because you were aware of what was going on and you were aware of the pivot that your mother was taking what were you doing internally to manage it. I think in the early days, well, actually, uh, I we I wasn't aware of my dad's diagnosis for a few years. I think the culture generally has been to sort of try and shield kids from some of those realities, at least at that time. And, mm-hmm. and to some extent, even now, because I think in Kenya still, until very recently, there's been a major stigma around mental health uh, issues. So um, for the most part, my mom tried to shield us. There were times my dad stayed, didn't live with us. We often have those of us in the city. We also sort of have a rural home. And sometimes my dad would be there for the most part uh, when I was younger. So you had some limited interactions at certain points. It's when I was probably around eight, seven or eight years old when he was back with us sort of on a more full-time basis and then you would engage with that. So I would say in those first years for my for my mother, the coping skill, um, a strategy was really to just be the single parent taking care of everything, making sure her daughters uh, became fairly self-sufficient. Our home was very democratic. I remember we used to, everyone had chores, everyone had their responsibilities from when I was fairly young. And on Saturdays, we'd have, uh, at some point, we had a meeting, a short meeting, where everyone ironed out their issues with everybody else. So you you sat down and said, I didn't like what you did this here, and I don't think this is fair to me, and everything would be settled on Saturday. And then the cycle was set again on Sunday. So uh, I think what that did for us really was... Uh, make us fairly independent, fairly uh, vocal about things going on. Um, And really, you know, in certain ways, we grew up fast, right? We grew up fast. Um, I think getting to know more about my dad, I mean, I would note, I didn't know the diagnosis even when he moved back. um, And that was a challenge for me. uh, But at the same time, my dad was also this incredible person who um, was a very thoughtful person, actually a lot more introspective, a lot more in tune with his inner self. (laughs) And I think in a way was the person who made me uh, a lot of uh, aware of that aspect uh, a lot more. I mean, he always, um, it was clear to me some of what his priorities were very early. Like he always wanted to make sure one was a deep thinker, one was open to other perspectives of other people. Even when I was very young, our discussions were as equals. And um, and then he cared a lot about family. He cared a lot about the environment, but he felt that we're part. A big part of our journey is really to learn from each other, different cultures, different perspectives, and 
that I would say is, uh, you know, I, I probably of all my siblings had, um, had that engagement a lot more with my father. So I really yeah. appreciate that. Well, it's beautiful. You know, um, my family member um, that has it is, is, is very thoughtful too, and very, very loving and um, um, quite communicative. So uh, I, I love that you have that. I, I want to talk about the fact that you chose a field that is highly masculine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so um, um, I, I, I did a, a, um, a podcast recently uh, with someone um, who was in finance in New York. And, and so we talked about uh, a little bit of how you navigate mm-hmm. being an uh, independent, brilliant woman in a field that's, that's male-dominated and still hold your energy and bring your gifts and get respect. And so how'd you navigate that? Uh, I think that had a lot to do with, well, the first stage, I, I, I have to say in Kenya, within the school system, if the, the, the distinction between gender, and, and I know that doesn't seem to be what we hear in the normal media, but once you're in the classroom, if you perform, there's really not much of a distinction. So you don't, it's not something that you think of a lot, that the fact that you're a woman doing these courses that are more, you know, getting into uh, math and some of the sciences. First of all, it, it, our system makes it quite compulsory to carry on that a good chunk of it all the way to, to the end of high school. So everyone has to take it all the way. Uh, but for me to to get into finance and continue with economics, I, I found that I had an intuition into it. I had a natural affinity towards um, economics specifically. Um, right from high school, I remember I was taking business courses and my profess- my teachers would always say, your, your questions are usually less about business and more about the economy. You should consider looking into this. Anyway, fast forward into my work, working in New York and being in that space, I found that um, I think what was helpful to some extent is that I I, I worked, I went back to graduate school after I'd worked a few years and therefore I had a lot more confidence in myself and I was very clear about what I wanted to achieve. Now, I found that being very grounded in, in t- from a you know knowledge perspective, so reading a lot, knowing what you're talking about um, was a big part of why I could be able to navigate the space. Um, I was able to define a space where I had, I was an subject matter expert. I was very clear about the kind of quality of work that I delivered on. And I think that helped me gain respect amongst my peers from my bosses and my direct reports. I mean, I think also it's very important to also have the buy-in of those that report to you. Um, and so that was, that was one way, but I, I have to say that fight is tough. Um, there are many times you you still do notice you get sidelined and sometimes it wasn't a gender issue. Sometimes it was also probably a, a racial issue, at, at least when I was in the US. In Kenya, I can't say that because <laughs> practically everyone is black, right? <laughs> but uh, um, so there, you, you learn what battles to fight. And then you also hope that there are people amongst those that believe in what you do that that can be your sponsors, that can be your mentors, and that will fight some battles, you know, behind closed doors for you. I find finding those kinds of allies were, was key, but a good chunk of it is really developing the tools and the skills that you require to really have confidence in, in, in your abilities and what you can deliver. Yeah, I love that. And, I, you know, and I think that goes across the board. It's like really having confidence in yourself and, and, and being clear about what you want, how you want to deliver it, you know? So what would you say is the greatest challenge you've had, you know, um, um, navigating this life you've created? Because, you know, when we first met, we were on a call and you were naming all of these things that you were doing. And I was like, well, do you sleep? And so we laughed, you know, because I'm kind of the same kind of person. It's like, I got a lot of balls that I'm juggling, you know, but what's been the greatest challenge for you in navigating this thing called life? 
I think uh, even as I say and come across as this confident person, I think it's always that reinforcement <laughs> sometimes in in knowing that you can take on the next challenge and and all that. I think the well, I don't know if that's my greatest challenge, but it's one of the the constant challenges of always. Uh, you know, when you walk into a new space, being able to know, believe in yourself that you can, you know, you you can figure it out, and that it's just a matter of time. Sometimes that's it. Um, I think um, another area, and uh, now on a more personal one, has been because of doing many things, traveling a lot, has also been you know, uh, relationships, you know, long-term relationships. So I'm in my forties. Um, I still, I date, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not married. Uh, I don't have children. And I'm not saying that that was, is necessarily has been my top priority. It's been, you know, in and out ebb and flow in my life. But, uh, I think that has been a challenge, uh, sometimes, sometimes because you're moving around and it's hard to sustain long, uh, you know, long distance relationships. Mm -hmm. Sometimes because some of the work you do ends up being threatening to some people that you're with. And uh, so that I think has been a, a part, yeah, a, a challenge. But at the same time, I also look at it as um, uh, you know, you, sometimes you have a different priority at a particular time and and you have to give that that you know get through that and and when that is the key priority what will come will come yeah well and and I love that you're talking about that because you know I, I really believe that this is a time on the planet of women emerging I I really think that there's something powerful that is going on with our identities with our gifts with our brilliance you know coming forward and um uh, and the balancing act of, okay, education, career, travel, passions, you know, and then relationships, um, you know, is an interesting kind of dynamic. And the other part is, you know, I've interviewed a lot of women who have said it's been difficult to find men that are so secure within themselves that they can stand with you as you are as powerful and dynamic, you know, as they are. And so um, right. uh, it, it's, it's an interesting thing that's going on, but I, what I love is that there are women like you who are so clear about who you are and that, it, that the time and the space will occur the way it will occur for you. Cause, mm -hmm. cause I'm looking at you you're beautiful, you're smart, you know, you're accomplished, you know, I mean, it's going to take somebody powerful to stand with you because you're not going to be a shrinking violet, which I love. <laughs> no, I'm not. That's for sure. <laughs> My friends can attest to that. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, it's something, absolutely, I think it's, and it's it's world over. Right? It's it's something I think that at some point you think it's, it's maybe you, but I, I am, I'm very comfortable and I have to say, I've been very fortunate to also have grown up in, in a family um, that is very comfortable with that, like, and the extended family. I mean, I, I think of now, you know, my dad aside, my, if I think of my uncles, for example, who would be other, you know, male figures in my life um, uh, have generally been very supportive of, of their uh, wives and their wives are at par and they've been high achievers. I have to say quite a few of them. And, and, um, and so it's, it's, I know it exists, right. Yes. That there are men out there that do support strong, powerful women. And, and I am, I am, I'm not one to want to settle for less because I think then that would affect who I am and, you know, inherently and I would not be myself okay ladies I hope you heard that do not settle for less I just want I just want to make sure that that didn't go over your head um <laughs> so so I want to uh I want to talk about your passion for art right <laughs> yeah because, because when we first started before we started recording I mean your face lit up when you talked about that so talk to me about oh, your really? 
<laughs> well, it's so interesting because this is something that uh, I, I five years ago I wouldn't have said this would be me or, or all, but it was sort of a confluence of things that are important to me. So, well, aside from the education background I gave, I actually also did a diploma in technology and um, in the e-commerce time in the uh, dot-com period, I guess, in early 2000s. And it's an area that uh, is also of interest to me. And I kept feeling that I had not used that talent enough. So what happened is, uh, well, I guess I should have started with the art part. It was just a confluence of several things. I moved back to Kenya, in, as I said, in 2010. And then around 2012, I happened to be uh, to go visit some artists in some studio. I, I felt that, you know, I hadn't seen art some good art in a while and I think New York had spoiled me it was always in your face and and so I decided to go and visit a couple of artists in their studios and uh, just have a chat and see what work they were they had and I just felt such you know my spirit really you know was lifted um once I started engaging with them seeing their work it, you know there were there was amazing talent that was only known within a certain niche community, very small community, you know, they speak to themselves. And and I kept wondering, uh, after I bought one, two pieces, you'd have these artists call you back and they're like, do you want another piece? You're like, I'll get one when I can and if I see something that I like. But I found uh, why they'd come back to you in that way is because they really didn't have much of a market and they couldn't, They owed. so they came back to the people that bought previous work and were a little aggressive in trying to sell. And I tried to then understand the situation. Now, this is me putting on my economics hat. I wanted to understand the market failures, what's wrong in the value chain of the arts in, in, in Kenya. But I had not learned, you know, I had not uh, for once studied art ever. I could not draw uh, anything to save my life. So, but I really appreciated uh, artwork. So, uh, I decided to take on a project uh, to develop an online platform and try and showcase some of the artwork and see whether people would reach out and, and purchase, you know, market it internationally and locally. Um, as I also used it as a proof of concept in terms of what uh, what is possible, but also to help me sort of understand really what those market failures are. Once you're engaged in the market, you know, you're actually a part of it, then you have, you have, you know, uh, the data telling you this is what's going on and this is what's not working. And then you also develop the credibility within the sector to uh, talk to artists, but also to engage with government, which is something I was keen to do. Um, and to that end, I actually was involved in drafting the culture policy uh, for the country a few years ago. So um, um, that is how I started what's called candyart.com. So K-E-N-D-I-A-R-T.com. And essentially, initially it was this big, we had hundreds and hundreds of art pieces, but I realized it was very hard to coordinate with artists who don't always <laughs> understand markets that well. And I realized, oh, that was my first lesson. That wouldn't work. That model wouldn't work. And so we pared down and had fewer artists. We work with over 100 artists. Um, but online, when you go on the platform, you probably will not see more than 30 or 40. But we work from like up and coming artists, students, uh, who are still in university. Um, we work with part-time artists. They could be graphic artists by day, but they paint and, and sculpt at night. Uh, we work with some fairly established artists, but they're not only in Kenya. We work with artists from um, Sudan, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, Burundi and Rwanda, not so much. We've had a couple, but sustainably at least at about five countries are involved that's because Kenya is sort of the hub and uh, and probably has the largest uh, art market in the region even though it's quite underdeveloped and so my purpose for doing this was really a confluence of many interests of mine one 
the economic development aspect of it too. I still enjoy tinkering with technology, even though I think most of my skills are almost obsolete. And three, um, it was my love for art, which which I discovered, you know, in my days in New York. Oh, Christine. Well, I love that you did that. And I love that you brought your skills together. I mean, one of the things I, I, I hope that you ladies are listening to is that you can have different passions and interests and there are ways to bring them together to create because we live in a, an innovative and creative time on this planet. So I, I, I'm, I'm in awe of everything that you do. And I, I ask the same last question of every guest. And the question is, if this is women awakening, what is the one thing you want women to know about the importance of their waking up? One thing, can I say many things that all form <laughs> one? <laughs> it's hard to boil it down to one. Okay, if I really had had to try and encapsulate it in one, I would say live an intentional life. Um, that's it. But if you let me expound real quickly. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, think, I think it's because... Women, we're wordy, and I'm one of those. I, I talk a lot, but I think uh, it's an intentional life, you know, an examined life. And I think uh, to know that, uh, you know, life is short. Uh, lean into your passions, you know. Um, uh, your priorities can change over time, whether it's family, work, or, or, or your passions. And, and it's okay for things to change. It's important to be brave and to push yourself. Um, I think uh, we sometimes second guess ourselves a lot. And I think that's something we need to, we tr need to trust our instincts a bit more. Um, and, I, and finally, as part of that, I'd, uh, I'd say, you know, I think it's good for women to know that we have all the tools that we require to realize our life goals. They're right. all in us. Maybe some are underdeveloped than others. And we really just need to tap into that and develop where we need to develop, but really all the tools already exist in us. That is beautiful. Well, Christine, I am so happy to know you, um, to connect with you, to interview you, to hear what you're doing. And um, I'm really grateful that you came in and be on the show with me. Thank you, thank you so much, Cynthia. I appreciate this opportunity. And uh, I look forward to engaging with you in many other ways. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> so okay. ladies, I, I, I hope you will come back every week. Christina is an example of what women are doing all over this planet. I wanna remind you that you're powerful. I wanna remind you that you're dynamic. I wanna remind you that you're original, not another one like you on this planet. I want to remind you that just like she said, you have everything within you that you need to create the life you want to live. So be bold, be brave, be courageous, step up and step out, come back and meet my guests every week and know that I'm so excited for you. I'm so excited that you're on the planet because the world is waiting for your gifts. Many blessings and I'll see you next time. <laughs>